Chapter 7 Education in Kamalapuram Kamalapuram was a small town near Kadappa a district headquarters in the state of Andhra Pradesh Seshama Raju the brother of this body took me there and admitted me in the middle school There used to be acute water scarcity in that town As soon as I got up early in the morning I had to walk a long distance and bring water from a canal in a big earthen pot the process had to be repeated both in the morning and evening daily with the result i had practically no time to read my lessons by the time i completed the job of fetching water from the canal in the morning it would be 9 o'clock immediately i would partake of some ambali and rush to the school ambali is a sort of dalu dragi sankati that was left over the previous night to which a little salt is added for taste in those days there were no tiffins like idli dosa vada upma etc or potato kurmas for breakfast it was the practice in most of the houses to partake of some rice that was left over the previous night mixed with a small quantity of pickle there were wooden benches come desks in our classroom for the children they were designed in such a way that the students could keep their books underneath a plank and write their notes etc with the support of the plank above they could also sit comfortably on the bench attached to the desk three of us used to sit on one such desk in our desk i used to sit in the middle and two boys named ramesh and suresh on either side of me ramesh was the son of a sirastadar a revenue official of the state government only we three used to get first class in every examination a village fair used to be held on a big scale every year in a place called pushpagiri which was located in between kamalapuram and kadappa the drill teacher in our school who was also the scout master insisted that all the children must compulsorily participate in the scout camp and help the people visiting the fair he also instructed that all of us should get a pair of khaki shirt and trousers along with a leather belt and a whistle he told us that all the children should be ready with the scout uniform in a week's time he issued an order that all the children should go to pushpagiri and serve as scout volunteers in the fair to be held there how could i procure all these items i didn't even have a paisa in my pocket neither i could approach my parents for this purpose since they themselves were short of money then in those days a person having a 10 rupee note in his pocket was considered to be a rich man if one had a 100 rupee note he was verily a millionaire the father of this body gave me two annas at the time of my coming to kamalapuram to join the school there in those days two annas meant a big money it had great value Since my father belonged to a poor family he could give me only 2 annas I could manage the last 6 months of my stay there with those 2 annas I had absolutely no money left with me I was the monitor of my class then hence as a matter of convention I also had to be the leader of our scout group following this practice the drill master ordered me to lead the scout camp at Pushpagiri without fail He told me you must be ready on such and such date you must bring these children fully prepared my problem was how can i attend the scout camp without the uniform i thought over the matter deeply in fact i had only one pair of clothes shirt and trousers for the entire year as soon as i came home i used to wrap a towel around my waist and wash my school dress clean I had no money to get the dress ironed by a dhobi washerman hence I used to put some live embers in a small brass vessel and use it as an iron thereafter I used to keep them under a trunk for pressing the next day I would put on those pressed clothes and go to the school thus after continuous wash and wear the clothes were worn out and torn I did not have money even to buy a safety pin I used to join the tone ends with a cactus thong. Since I was thus managing with one set of dress for the entire year, 
how could I afford to purchase a new pair of khaki shirt and trousers for the scout camp? I could not also say that I would not attend the camp. Moreover, it would be damaging the honor and prestige of the family to admit that we could not afford to purchase a khaki dress for the scout camp. I was in a dilemma as to what to do. I thought over the matter carefully and devised a plan to tide over the situation. I informed my classmates, I am not feeling well, hence I cannot attend the scout camp. I took care, however, not to reveal this ploy to the teacher. I selected a boy to be my assistant and I told him, You lead these boys to the scout camp. I will come later. But the children refused to attend the camp in my absence. They protested in one voice, Raju, if you are not attending the camp, we will also stay back. Not only that, they even came to our house and started pressurizing me to lead them to the scout camp. They did not leave me alone even in the classroom. It had come to a stage where I was unable to withstand that pressure. My classmate and benchmate Ramesh, who was the son of a Sirastadar, could understand my predicament well. He was of the same size as I was. He went to his father and requested him, Father, I like the khaki dress very much. Please get two sets stitched for me. His intention in asking for two sets was to give me one. He was really fortunate in entertaining such noble ideas of helping his friend and classmate. Such type of samskara, noble thoughts, comes to a person from previous births. Ramesh, however, did not reveal his plan either to me or to his father. Since he was the only son to his father, and his father was a well-to-do person, he got two sets stitched as per his request. Ramesh then got one set packed in a newspaper and put it in my desk along with a small chit. He wrote in the chit, Raju, I am like your younger brother. If you do not accept this dress, I will commit suicide by throwing myself under a moving train. Please, therefore, accept this dress without fail. I noticed this packet and chit in my desk. I took the chit out and tore it into pieces. I wrote another chit. It is true that you are like my brother. However, the friendship between us cannot last longer if it is based on a give-and-take relationship. Such a type of relationship cannot be a permanent one. Ours is a heart-to-heart -heart and a love-for-love -love relationship. If you really want our friendship to last forever, you should not do such things. If friendship between two individuals is to develop, only love is to be exchanged between them, not articles. If articles are exchanged, love ceases to exist. Hence, if you want the friendship between us to remain unaffected, you take away this dress. Ramesh felt very sorry on reading my letter. However, he could not disregard my feelings. He, therefore, took back the dress. The children in those days never used to disobey my command. Some boys keep their study tables very shabbily with books strewn all over. They make them clumsy and dirty. But I used to keep my books always neat and tidy. In those days, very few boys were in a position to purchase new books when they were promoted to a higher class. Every four or five years, the textbooks changed. I always kept my books neat like new books. Hence, boys studying in the lower standard who were promoted to the higher class used to buy my books. During a particular year, a poor boy approached me and requested for my books. I showed all my textbooks to him. In those days, there used to be high syllabus even for lower classes in subjects like history, geography, civics, etc. On seeing my books, he commented, Raju, you don't seem to have touched your books at all. They appear to be brand new. I told him, habits and behavior keep them like new books.
The cost of my books totaled to twelve rupees, but the poor boy was not in a position to pay even that much. Then I told him, "My dear, I am selected by our teacher for the scout camp. I have to purchase khaki dress and shoes. Besides, there are other items of expenditure. I don't have money to incur that expenditure, nor I would like to ask my parents. What I need at the moment is five rupees. Therefore." Pay me five rupees and take away these books. The boy felt very happy and immediately paid the amount. In those days, currency notes were very rare. Therefore, he paid the entire amount in small coins packed in a piece of cloth. It was tied in an old cloth, which, unable to bear the weight of the coins, got torn, and the coins were strewn all over the room, making a big sound. On hearing the sound. The lady of the house came there and inquired, "From where did you get all this money? Did you steal it from my trunk?" So saying, she slapped me. The poor boy, who was witnessing this incident, explained to her, "Mother, I gave those coins to Raju towards the cost of his books, which I purchased from him." She did not believe his words and took away all the money. The next day. All my classmates were going to Pushpagiri, where a cattle fair was being held, to participate in a scout camp. I told my teacher that I would start the next morning and join the group. Early in the morning, I set out on my journey on foot. I walked a long distance, and before I could join my colleagues, they had left for their breakfast. As for myself, I did not have even a paisa in my pocket. What do I eat for my breakfast? I thought I would manage somehow without eating anything. I purposely avoided my classmates then, lest they might inquire whether I had my breakfast. My classmates were, however, searching for me, making inquiries. Has Raju come? There was a masonry tank nearby in which water was stored for bathing the cows and buffaloes. The water was very dirty, but what can I do? In those circumstances. That dirty water itself was Ganga. I was feeling very tired, hungry, and thirsty, having walked all the way. I therefore washed my face with that dirty water and drank some. Then I noticed that someone had left behind a packet of beedies, country cigarette, and a one anna coin on the tank there. The beedies were, of course, of no use to me. Therefore, I threw them away. I took the one anna coin and exchanged it for four smaller coins, buttus or kanis. As I was returning, I noticed a person sitting on the roadside, playing cards spread over a cloth, and inviting passers-by to bet on a particular card. He invited me, saying, "Raju, you are a very lucky boy. Come, come and bet some amount on any card you like." He offered double the amount to the winner. No doubt, this was a sort of gambling, but I was completely helpless at that time. I therefore put one coin each on different cards. Every time, I was winning the bet and getting double the amount I invested. Thus, I played the game till I could make sixteen annas, one rupee. Then, I thought that that was the end of the game. And returned with the money already earned. Since I was feeling hungry, I purchased three dosas with one buttu. In those days, dosas were available at the rate of one for a dhammidi, one third of a buttu. Thus, I managed with two buttus a day eating dosas. I joined the scout duty along with my friends. During night, I kept the bundle of coins under my head and slept on the sandy floor. Since I was very much tired due to the long walk, I was lost in sound sleep. During sleep, my head slid to a side, and the coins bundle came into the open. Someone noticed that bundle and took it away without disturbing me. When I woke up the next day, I noticed that the cloth bundle containing the money was stolen by somebody. I had no money to buy even one dosa. My classmates were very much dejected with my plight. They were in fact crying. 
they pleaded with me to eat at least one dosa which they offered to buy for me. But I flatly refused. I told them I was not hungry since I did not like to avail myself of others' help. Especially, I did not wish to touch others' money. So, I left that place. After conclusion of our scout camp, I took home some sweets, fruits and things like that which I had purchased. As soon as I stepped into the house, I noticed that Seishima Raju was drawing lines in a notebook with the help of a ruler. He was very angry that his wife had to fetch water during my absence for three days and she was very much tired. I offered her the fruits and sweets brought by me from Pushpagiri. Instead of accepting them gracefully, she threw them away, saying, Who wants these things? Seishima Raju was further infuriated. He took the ruler into his hands and bet me on the forearm. The ruler broke into three pieces. My hand was swollen. I was helpless as I could not reveal this incident to anybody. I myself tied a bandage with a wet cloth on the swollen hand. The next day, one of the sons of Seishima Raju died. He gave a telegram to Venkama Raju. In those days, there was no post office or telegraph office in Puttaparthi. The telegrams were received at Bukkapatnam and from there a messenger used to take them to Puttaparthi. Pedda Venkama Raju used to go to Bukkapatnam regularly to purchase some items in the village fair. He saw that telegram there and immediately rushed to Kamalapuram. When he reached Seshama Raju's house, he found all the members of the family deeply immersed in sorrow. I too had to pretend to be sorrowful, even though I am beyond joy and sorrow. In the meanwhile, Graham Abai saw my hand tied with a bandage and inquired how it happened. I tried to explain away very casually as if nothing had happened. I told him that a small boil had appeared on the forearm and as it was giving me pain, I tied a bandage around it. Pedda Venkama Raju was however not convinced with my reply. There was one woman belonging to the Vaishya community by name Subama in the neighboring house who used to make her living by preparing and selling dosas. One day, she called Griham Abai and told him, What? Venkama Raju? I know you are sufficiently well off to get Raju educated in your place. Why should you put him to so much trouble by keeping him under the care of his elder brother at such a distant place? You do not know how much suffering the boy is undergoing here. He has to fetch drinking water from a distant place carrying two big pitchers with the help of a kavadi on his shoulders daily. He is made to undergo a great ordeal here. In the meanwhile, during night, Graham Abai wanted to go out for answering nature's call. There was no light in that place. I held a small kerosene lamp in one hand and a jug of water in the other. After reaching the outskirts of the town, Graham Abai asked me, Satya, stop, stop, keep the lamp on the ground. He held both my hands and cried profusely. He told me, My dear son, one can make a living even by selling salt if only one is alive. Did I send you here because I was unable to bring you up? Why do you undergo so much suffering here? I, being your father, have never beaten you even once till now. These people are making you undergo a great ordeal. You start immediately and come along with me. I tried to pacify him, saying, No, no, what these people say is not true. No one here is putting me to any trouble. He was not convinced and insisted on my going back to Puttaparthi. Then I explained the situation carefully thus, It is not proper for you to take me away from this place right now. If I go away from the house now, there will be no one to attend to the work in the house. You don't think otherwise. You please go now and I will follow you later. I did not make any complaint against the members of the family there. 
I never revealed the fact that my hand was swollen only on account of Sesha Maharaj's beating. I never had the habit of complaining against elders. I always tried to protect the dignity and honor of the family. So, I tried to convince Griham Abai, saying, It is not proper on my part to inconvenience these people, especially when they were immersed in sorrow due to the passing away of their child. Not only that, the neighbors may also think bad of me if I come away with you in the present situation. We must also be mindful of what others may say about us. We should, therefore, not give any scope for such things. You please go to Puttaparthi now. I will come after a fortnight if you wish. On hearing my reply, Grim Abai shed tears. He left for Puttaparthi alone, saying, My dear son, how noble are your qualities. It is only your good nature that will protect you. Before leaving, he inquired, Do you need any clothes? I replied, I have plenty. I don't need anything. He felt very happy and left. However, before leaving, he contacted a shopkeeper by name Kote Subbanna and told him, If our boy approaches you for any help, please oblige. If he needs some clothes, please get them stitched and give him. You don't worry about the money. I will send you. As soon as he reached Puttaparthi, he started writing letters one after the other, asking me to start immediately. He also wrote in some letters, Your mother is serious. Start immediately, since he was doubtful of my coming there. I knew that there was nothing serious so far as her health condition was concerned. Hence, I stayed in Kamalapuram itself with Seshama Raju till the examinations were over. In the meanwhile, things came to normal with the passage of time. Wolf Messing During my student days in Kamalapuram, myself and a few other students used to go to the railway station every evening regularly for a walk. There we spent some time discussing spiritual topics. In those days, there were not many trains touching Kamalapuram. One or two trains in a day used to pass through that railway station. One day, we were sitting on a bench in the railway station. The boys were asking some questions and I was answering them. In the meanwhile, a white-skinned foreigner by name Wolf Messing saw me through the window of the train that was approaching the station. He tried to get down from the train even before it stopped. He fell down. My classmates, Ramesh and Suresh, who were sitting with me, anxiously said, Oh God! Poor fellow! He must have broken his leg. I firmly told them, Nothing has happened. He is coming to see me only. Hence, no danger will happen to him. You remain calm and quiet. He did not have even a handbag in his hands. He was shedding tears of joy, gazing at me. Ramesh and Suresh witnessed this scene. In those days, the children were very much afraid that the white-skinned foreigners would take away boys forcibly and enroll them in the armed forces. Hence, on seeing Messing approaching me, Ramesh started running to his house to inform his parents. As soon as he reached home, he told his father, Father, some foreigner had alighted from the train just now to take away our Raju. You must start immediately in a jeep. His father rushed to the railway station, lifted me up, put me in the jeep and drove me to his house saying, Raju, I will take you to your house after some time. Let us first go to my house. Wolf Messing followed the jeep. He sat before that house for a long time. Whenever he could see me through the window, he would wish me and try to communicate something to me. But... The members of the house closed all doors and windows, forbidding any sort of communication between us. Sesimaraju, elder brother of Swami, was working as a teacher then in the same town. The father of Ramesh sent word to him through an attender thus, One white-skinned foreigner is waiting outside our house with the intention of taking away Raju forcibly. Raju is presently in our house only. 
I will drop him at your house safely after some time. Thereafter, Wolf Messing returned to the railway station, boarded some train and left for some place. Before he left, he wrote on the front door of the house with a pencil, You are most fortunate to keep this boy who is the embodiment of divinity in your house and serve him. I am not that fortunate. I deserve only this much. Thanks. Thereafter, he left for Russia. Wolf Messing came to India after a long gap of many years. He went to Kamalapuram and inquired about me. By then, I was no longer the same Raju. My name had changed. The local people informed Messing. He has now become a guru. His name is Sri Satya Sai Baba. He may now be available either in Puttaparthi or Bangalore. He came to my ashram in Whitefield, Bangalore. On that day, he found several devotees sitting there waiting for someone. When he made inquiries, he was informed that they were waiting for Sri Satya Sai Baba's darshan. He also waited. While I was moving in the darshan lines, he said to himself, This is the same person whom I saw way back in Kamalapuram. The same divine effulgence is shining brilliantly here also. Thereafter, he met the principal of Brindavan College, Narendra. Narendra was a great teacher who used to teach the students well. His father's name was Damodar Rao. He was a judge. Narendra's father-in-law's name was Sundar Rao, who was an eminent doctor. Both of them were there at that time. Messing commented in their presence, Swami is verily God Himself. He is at present not manifesting Himself in His true form. You are able to see His normal human form only. If you can visualize the aura around Swami, you will realize His true nature. The next day, early in the morning, while I was giving darshan to the devotees who had assembled there after completing the Nagar Sankirtan, Wolf Messing could visualize great effulgence around my body. Later, when he met me, he shed tears saying, My dear, you are my everything. I am your instrument. You are my everything. I showed him what all had to be shown to him and I told him, what all has to be told. I also explained to him, in accordance with the saying, Deva Manusha Rupena, God incarnates in human form and appears as an ordinary human being. Later, he returned to his native country, Russia. After a few days, Principal Narendra received a letter. Messing wrote in that letter, How fortunate you are to work in an educational institution established by God Himself. I wish that you please write letters now and then informing me of Swami's divine leelas and avataric mission. One day, myself and Narendra were sitting together and discussing something. Suddenly, Messing appeared there from nowhere. How did he come there? Nobody knew. He needed no ticket to come to India. He just came, Swami and disappeared as quickly as he came there. That was a great miracle that all people cannot witness. Nor all can understand the phenomenon even if I explain.